الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ولي الصالحين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله الأمين صلوات ربي وسلامه عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد We praise Allah abundantly the way he deserves to be praised and we bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah he has no partners and we bear witness that Muhammad is his slave and his messenger we ask Allah to exalt his mention, grant him peace and send his salutations and his blessings upon him upon his companions and all those who follow them on their, right, on their path of righteousness until the day of recompense this is the introduction that Muslims usually use more or less um, it might be unusual for some and it has a lot of profound statements and uh, the good news is that this lecture will directly and indirectly address such an introduction the title of the lecture I would say uh, it's quite audacious I don't know if you guys are students here and I'm done with my uh, education already uh, does anyone know what audacious means audacity but you're trying to make it easier all right we have three people the rest don't know what audacious is it's fantastic right it's just great so it's like when something is so in your face and like rude you know like someone someone cuts you off while driving and then they scream at you and it's like um, it's your fault and I'm innocent so we say they have the audacity to yell at me when they're guilty. Okay, someone audacious. So sometimes the title can be audacious. You know, born believers. Okay. Um, just the title could be audacious, let alone the concept. If I want to pitch the idea that everybody here was born as a believer, you're one of two people. Um, either you had good assumptions, you said maybe they're referring to themselves. Muslims are talking about themselves because they talk about themselves all the time. So we'll let this one slide. No problem. He's referring to himself. He was born a believer. So was everybody else among the Muslims. I'll hear what they have to say. Or you might be thinking, excuse me, how dare you speak on behalf of mankind and claim that all of us were born believers. And so you might come here with the intention to prove me wrong. Either way, I feel you, and I'm not mad, I'm not mad. Uh, I understand why such feelings and sentiments may exist, simply because the world we're living in now has changed a lot. So my intention is to present this to the best of my ability, um, to prove from a religious, logical, and sometimes scientific point of view that each human being was born with the natural tendency to believe in one God it's not easy but someone has to do it in Islam we call it fitra fitra for many uh, they, they, what comes to mind when you say fitra is zakatul fitr on you know in Ramadan that's another misconception for the Muslims specifically. I'm not going to waste time on it. But that is not the right terminology for Zakat al-Fitr or Eid al-Fitr. Even though we will see that from a linguistic point of view, the word, the word Fatara itself and Futira ala shay has to do with Tubi'a. Something that has been stamped, imprinted in a particular way. So anything which has this kind of innate nature to it, we use the term Taba'a or Tubi'a synonymous with Fatara or Futira. And that's why we hear that Allah is Fatiru Samawati Wal Ard. He is the originator of the heavens and the earth. He made them without any pre existing example. There was never a heavens and earth, and then they were used as a template to create another. There was nothing, and then they came into existence. That makes it that concept of bringing something into existence without without any example from before this is fatara and that's why we call it fitra it's that natural disposition that every human being is born in born with now this is the linguistic meaning and of course the linguistic meaning will lead us to the religious meaning and what we're more concerned about is the religious meaning because linguistically you can debate on so many things 
um, you know, the word hot, which is something some of you are feeling right now, can never be agreed upon. Man, that looks hot. What does that mean? Right? When you say hot, it could be bad. I'm hot. You need an air condition. Or this is hot meaning it's cool. Wait. Hot meaning it's cool. Uh, these are like antonyms. Mafi mushkila. No problem. Somehow we managed to make these, uh, you know, these terms that are opposite have the same meaning. Why? Because words and, and you know, vocabulary is a very broad discussion. So let's say you disagree with the term. No issue. Religiously, we have to refer to our revelation. Every person who represents any type of entity, ideology, university, school, religion, whatever, when they speak, they have to refer to their sources. What they consider to be the reference for them to share with the, with the rest of the world. In our case, whenever Muslims have something to present, it is not about how I personally feel as an individual, or how a group of us feel, or how this university feels. It's about the revelation which we received. The good news is, if we were to leave it up to me and you, then we will have a disaster. Because every time you hear a different speaker, then you will get a new religion. According to his perception of the religion. And then we will never be unified upon anything. But in our case, we have revelation, we have text. Text which cannot be altered, it cannot be changed, it cannot be distorted, it cannot be played with. Attempts can be made unsuccessfully. Unsuccessfully. Evidence, 1400 years into the revelation of the Quran, not a single human being or a group of people or a country or an organization were able to produce anything like the Quran to confuse the people. Where the people say, wait a second, is this the Quran? Is this not? This will never, this has never happened and it will never happen. It's done. The Quran revealed from our Creator as we believe is done. No one can add a single letter to it. It's over. And no other human being can say this with this audacity. Really, they can't. Because it's open for distortion. It's open for revision. It's open for consideration. We cannot do that to the revelation. So we use the revelation as that source. That is our focal point and our strength point. Because anyone who wants to disapprove can. But he will have to, he or she will have to disapprove the authority and the authenticity of this revelation. And this is a lifetime mission that they will never accomplish. Even if they were to leave it as an inheritance for their children, they will never finish. Then their grandchildren, they will never finish. And the world will come to an end and they would never finish. Generations after generations. So that's beautiful. And it gives us this confidence which we human beings need. Because self-confidence you know, we're all full of mistakes, full of imperfections, full of errors. That can only take you so long. And each one of us knows him or herself. Whatever you put up before the people is different than what we know internally. We know we're lousy in so many ways. People don't see that. So there's a hypocrisy in it no matter how you look at it. But when we refer to the revelation, then our shortcomings and faults are irrelevant to the discussion. I can be the worst person in the world, but if I'm quoting and citing textual evidence revealed, I have power. As long as people don't misuse it. So what did our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, may Allah exalt his mention and grant him peace, what did he say in regards to this concept of fitra? It's a very controversial, I would say, narration. For those of you hearing it for the first time, you might be taken back. For those who are not Muslims, then this will be news to you. Let's see how you digest it. And the hadith is narrated by the companion Abu Huraira, one of the companions of the Prophet, collected by the scholar of uh, hadith or narrations, Al-Bukhari. So these are the most reliable figures we have. The Prophet Sallallahu said, مَا مِن مَوْلُودٍ يُولَدْ there isn't a single newborn, any newborn baby 
that comes into existence, no one comes except that he is upon his fitrah, the natural disposition. فَأَبَوَاهُ يُهَوِّدَانُهُ أَوْ يُنَصِّرَانُهُ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانُهُ أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم Then it is his parents because this is the general principle. It could be, it could be uncle and aunt, nephews, cousins, environment, society. Someone can say, well, I was born an orphan. My parents had nothing to do with it. It doesn't matter. The hadith is speaking about the general norm. There are exceptions to the rule, for sure. It is then his parents, or let's just say his environment, which will make him a Jew, or a Christian, or a Magian. And then today we can add, right? Or an atheist, or an agnostic, agnost, or so on and so forth, Hindu, Buddhist, and the list goes on. Who can deny this? Who can deny that by default, the children are upon the same religion of their parents until they choose otherwise. Can anyone deny that point? Isn't it that when a child is raised in a house where Christianity is practiced, he will or she will by default be Christian until some point in time when they decide after some investigation, after some research, whatever the reasons may be, that they decide to say, you know what, that's beautiful, you guys are nice people, but I'm out. I don't believe in God. I want to become an atheist. And they depart. You don't speak to a child who's three, four years, uh, four years old and says, I don't believe in God, while his parents believe in God. It just doesn't happen. In fact, if you say this to any child, even if he has not or she has not received religious training, they will refute you. And we will see psychologically, according to scientists, why? Because it, from, from the way human beings are created, from a physiological point of view, it is proven that by default they believe in God. And that's what the hadith is saying. Children, by default, believe in God. So it's the environment which impose on this person some other choice. Then the Prophet gave us an example. He said, look at the, um, the animal, how it is born intact. Do you observe any among them that are maimed? By default, unless there's a deformality, physical deformality, human beings are, nobody is born with a piercing. Have you ever seen someone, a girl born already two piercings? Oh, that's so nice, you saved us money, sweetie. <laughs> with a ponytail and a tie? Nope, doesn't happen. Children are born, they, this, they might have an issue, physical deformality. Otherwise, they don't have some changes that we later impose, like a tattoo, for example. So like any, any animal, when you look at them, they're all born the same. Then in the animal you know, world, people, the, 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 the shepherd, he will slit the ear of the sheep or put some mark on its forehead to identify it, which is which. It's not like they have names. This is Robert, this is, uh, you know, Patrick, this is uh, Abdullah, this is a sheep. <laughs> what are you talking about, man? Well, you know, I like to give them names. So that's nice. That's for you. But for the rest of us, they all look the same. So unless you have a mark on it, then you distinguish between them. Otherwise, they're all born the same. So human beings change things, and then when they change them, they become changed, of course. But in their original state, they were not like that. So here we learn from this hadith, or from this narrative, that when each one of us was born, he was not born with any type of belief other than the natural belief that there's one God. Evidence, logical evidence. If you were to be born on an island, let's say, you went with your parents to an island and then, I mean, this is hypothetical, so don't get all sensitive and emotional and start crying. And your parents passed away, okay, on the island. And you were like, I don't know, four years old or something of the sort, three, four years old. You know, old enough for you to walk around and figure out things on your own. So you had to live on this island. You had to struggle, survive on this island on your own. 
they, they, were, they, they were vegetables and trees and what have you, obviously to make life easier for you. It's not like there was a fridge, you just open the fridge, oh, that's fantastic, there's some spaghetti. You know, it's not gonna happen on an island. But you were able to pull through and survive. Do you think at some point in time, you would look at a tree and say, this is God? This is, this is my God. I'm going to worship this tree for now. Why? It's beautiful. It's green. It's been around since I was born. It must have been there before I was born. And it looks like after I die, it will stay there. So, conclusion, this is an eternal looking tree. That's my new God. Can anyone, do you think any human being, any infant, after they start growing and, and prospering and exploring life, do you think they will come to such a conclusion? Please. Or they say the sun... The sun is my God. Or then at night they say, you know what? The moon looks a little nicer. And it doesn't burn. It's a little more romantic. Even though you're by yourself on the island. So, so much for romance. But still, you know, with hopes and expectations that one day you'll get married. Yeah. Not to a, not to a monkey. Unless you believe we came from monkeys. In which case it'll be normal. Hey, that could have been my grand, 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 grandfather's cousin nice to meet you yeah right whatever so anyways you how will you come to a conclusion that any of these items are a god you have no radio no television no newspapers no magazines no scriptures no revelation nobody to talk to it is impossible that you would come up with any such conclusion what seems to be the most probable scenario that you would believe in the existence of a power. You are forced to believe in the existence of a power because everything around you proves it. You will have to explore and contemplate all mankind on your environment and yourself. The hand. You know what a, what a wild object this is? You know how many things we do with our hands? You see, everything you're, you're, you're using right now in this hall is because of the hands of the son of Adam. Airplanes, buildings, huge constructions. Because you're going to say that they were made by machines. Yes, how are the machines made? By hand. No, blah, blah, blah. Who drew the machine the first time? The architect, the engineer, who drew it on paper before it became what it is? Hands. It's all with the hands. What is this limb? This only one limb. Forget about the eyes and the ears and the brain, which is analyzing information as we speak and passing judgment. As I speak, you're analyzing and judging. Analyzing and judging. Therefore, the reaction. <laughs> Boring. I don't like this joke. Stop joking, please. It's fine. You're entitled to this opinion. I'm going to joke throughout. But you're, you're analyzing my speech as we speak right now. And English could probably might not be your mother tongue. So your brain is already understanding a foreign language. I mean, this is so complicated. How are you going to tell me we came from nothing? By some chance, by some explosion, by some whatever you want to call it. Come on, please. Or how would you assume that, that there isn't a great supernatural power behind this? Would you not observe on the island the alternation of the night and the day? Every day, the sun rises from one place, it sets in another. The movement of the clouds, the rain, the ocean, the sea. If you were just to go swimming and then see what's under the sea, it's mesmerizing. So you as a human being would come to the conclusion that there's a great supernatural power that you're unable to see. You will not expect it to present itself before you and say, I am your God. You will be very skeptical, in fact, if something presented itself before you, some sort of ghost, and said, I am your God. True or false? You will think anything. It's go ghost, it's jinn, it's different stuff. You would not assume that this is your creator speaking to you. Don't worry about the cameras. The focus is shifting to the cameraman. Thank you, sir. Would you like to go lecture with me? You already are. Anyways, so by default, 
You would not believe so. This is a logical explanation. Now, you can argue, of course. Look, anything you present to the people, they can argue. But how far and how long are you going to argue for? And how successful is your argument? And is it, is it agreeable to most of the people? We have to understand that a lot of the things in this world have to do with the majority. Not everything, but many things have to do with the majority. The majority agree on something, holds certain value. And the minority remain to be a minority. So when most people will agree to something and you have some individuals who disagree, with all due respect, they remain to be individuals who are disagreeing. The vast majority is what matters. So why we can argue that no, maybe someone will worship another object on this island, most will tell you they probably will not think of anything else and consider it to be their God. And if someone were to make an idol or a statue from this tree, they say, you know what, I agree with you. The tree in and of itself is not worthy of worship. I will sculpture something from the tree. Then we will say, who made who? Did you make God or did God make you? Because if you sculptured it, then you made it. So now you're God. At least to this ob object, you are its God, meaning you are its creator. So how are you going to worship what you made? And the idea of worshiping is giving you know, you know, reverence, reverence and, 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 and respect, respect and, and awe to a greater power that has abilities that you lack. Otherwise, nobody would worship anyone if you thought you were self-sufficient. Why is it that human beings, if the airplane is about to, you know, fall into the ocean and they're about to die, why is it that at that moment they remember God? Or they feel the urge and the need to speak to a greater being because they believe at this moment only God, even though they may not be believers in God, only God can pull them out from this, this problem, this issue. Only God can save them. Otherwise, if somebody was self-sufficient, he wouldn't be asking God for anything. He would say, okay, buddy, let's jump out of this plane now. I have the power, I have the strength. I'm a smart human being. Oh my God, I'm not moving from my seat. It looks like I'm going to die. Goodbye now. That's exactly what's going to happen. Unless you watch a lot of James Bond. Now only people who watch a lot of some crazy stuff. You're just going to have like the special watch when you press on the thing and then the seat just jumps out of the, you know, the roof of the plane and you fly, land with a parachute in your Mercedes to drive off and you know, kill the... Come on, man. This is Hollywood stuff. In real life, people freak out and die. You know, and, you know, and these, these movies are so silly. If you think about them, the dude gets shot like a million times in the movie. People are shooting at him the whole time. And like he just, the bullets just don't hit him. You know what I mean? It's like he gets 10 bullets at the same time, all of them like somehow, you know, and then he shoots once and four people fall. It's how that. And then if they really wanted to kill him, they could have put a bomb and killed him a long time ago. And we as Muslims are against bombs. It's a good time for a disclaimer, just in case you misunderstood. But no, no, I mean the movie is meant to be suspense, you know. How did we get to the Hollywood stuff? So yeah, what I was saying is, the human being, no matter how confident you are in yourself, at the end of the day, you know you are dependent. You are dependent on a greater power. And this is really the crux of this lecture. Because we can ph philosophize for hours and talk and talk and talk, but the bottom line is, what you know deep in your heart is that you are dependent on the greater power. You have no control of your breath. You have no control of your heartbeat. You have no control of digesting food after you chew it and swallow it. You have no control that you'll be able to go to the bathroom at the end and relieve yourself. Can you imagine if you ate and you couldn't go to the bathroom? Can you control that? You are the, the president of the country. You're the king. You are everything. You own half of the world. Eat and not go to the bathroom, don't have the ability to go to the bathroom, what are you going to do? Nothing. You will die. This is the son of Adam. But 
Allah told us how we are. أَوَلَمْ يَرَى الْإِنسَانُ أَنَّ خَلَقْنَاهُ مِنْ نُطْفَةٍ فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيبٌ مُبِينٌ Does the son of Adam not see that we created him from a sperm drop? It's a beautiful analogy. It's a fact. You were a sperm drop, sir. And me too, by the way. This is, I'm not, not trying to put you down or anything. But that's what you got to think about. That's pretty nasty. That's nasty. And now you're a full functioning human being with eyes and hearing and so on and so forth. And now you want to argue with your creator. Who brought you from this drop? Really? The audacity. You see that word is beneficial, huh? You can use it in your next essay. Put my name as a reference. We learned it in the lecture, Islamic Society lectures. It's great, my English is improving. So the truth of the matter is, we have to internally stop fooling ourselves. We have to be transparent with ourselves. We know our shortcomings and our deficiencies. Once we acknowledge them, we have to appreciate the one who is in full control. And this is why Islam is considered to be the religion of fitra. Islam is considered to be the religion of fitra. Meaning the natural religion. Why is it natural? Do you, can you look at the problems of the world today? No, they can look at the camera. He's not even here. I forgot what I was saying. See, that's why I'm easily distracted. In my lectures back home, kids are not allowed. If, if somebody brings a child and they start crying, I don't know what I'm lecturing about. I start talking about Samsung and smartphones and everything. People are like, dude, this is a religious lecture. Say, my bad. This kid just, you know, messed it up for me. So I'm easily distracted. Obviously, you guys are equally easily distracted. And so, uh, turn it on, please. And let's move on with the lecture. Because I was saying something. Yes. The natural religion. Look at the problems of the world. Do you know how many problems Islam is the only solution for these problems? Who knows the hadith about 10 things from being from the fitrah? What are the things that Islam said are natural for man? From a physical point of view, what are we supposed to do? Clip. This is religiously speaking. Our religion says that from the natural way of the son of Adam is clipping the nails. Clipping the nails, both obviously hands and toes. How could that be religious? Well, look at the effects or the consequences of not clipping the nails. Either you want to enter the Guinness Book of Records with the longest nails, which is just disgusting. In all honesty, even though some might like that stuff, you know, that's just what they call fetish. We're not going to discuss that. But the norm is, if you saw someone had long nails and there was like dirt, you know, black spots under their nails, you're going to be like, and they put their hand in their chi in your chicken and says, here you go. <laughs> this is when you realize you're not hungry. <laughs> no, thank you so much, I'm full. You're dying. You would eat this chicken and five more. But at that moment, it's no longer yummy. So we say this is natural. The beard. Isn't it crazy how the beard became the fashion? We Muslims have been rocking the beard since I don't know when. Oh no, since I know when. Since 1400 years ago. And before that, the Jews and the Christians of old. In fact, it was the norm for men to keep their beards. That's why it grows on your face. You know what I mean? It's not like it grows on your arm that you stick it to your face. It grows right where it needs to be, whether you are hairy or not. Because someone right now who only has little hair saying, well, uh, not in my case. Well, it's okay. We said there are exceptions to the rule. But why does the hair grow on your face? Because you're supposed to keep it. Oh, and it doesn't grow on women's face. Exceptions exist as well. 
Because it's just not, it's feminine. You don't want a wife with a beard. Do you? You're tripping if you want a wife with a beard. So now it became the fashion, you know, actors, basketball players, you know, everybody's rocking a beard, and now it became okay. Alhamdulillah, it made life easy for us Muslims. Because now we don't look so alienated. You know, when you go to the airport, it's like, okay, there's other looking terrorists, not just me. <laughs> According to them, of course, you're thinking in the mind of the, you know, I don't know, surveillance cameras and the people's security. You know, when you're not a terrorist. But now again, nowadays, a Muslim is automatically a terrorist if he has a religious appearance. So now when I look at others, say, okay, it could be me or you, man, nobody knows. <laughs> but they ruined it with this hairstyle, you know, they, they don't keep their full hair. They cut half of it, do that little thing, so now they know that, okay, this is not a Muslim, he's just trying to look cool. But now the beard became the fashion, even though some of you are still not rocking a beard. But if you were to let it grow, you realize why. It's a natural thing. It's a natural, natural way of men. And it saves you a lot of headache. How much money have you spent on razors and Gillette and shaving foam? And how many times you've cut yourself and how many classes you've missed or you were late to because you didn't shave on time or you felt awkward because you're not feeling fresh or it's that one millimeter, you know, uh, hair growth. What do they call it? Shade? You know, like uh, what was it? George Michael back in the day? Yeah, well, you don't know about that because you're still young. So, I mean, you've wasted a lot of time and money. If you just let your beard grow, you'll be having a blast. And the same goes for armpit hair. You're supposed to grow your armpit hair, right? No, in our religion, you're supposed to remove it. Some will say, why would you remove your armpit hair? Because it's fresh. And you stink less. You become stinkless. In fact, and observe, try, try removing your armpit hair. This is an Islamic instruction to males and females. And we can go on about so many other things, which Islam called fitra, part of the fitra, the natural disposition, which now the medicine and the medical field prove to be the healthiest and the safest for people. And going against them is, is a reason for bacteria and different types of diseases to spread. So when you wash your hands with soap and your nails are clean and you wash them as well, you can pretty much guarantee that you have now removed bacteria from your hands. If you have long nails, then the bacteria will still be under your nails. And nobody washes every single nail when they wash their hands. They just wash their hands and the stuff remains right down there. So Islam deals with this idea from a physical point of view and more importantly from a spiritual point of view. But here comes the problem. The alienation and the diversion from the natural disposition. Why is it that people divert from the norm and do other things and they might do them for so long and so frequently that they become, the, the abnormal becomes normal and the normal becomes abnormal. And we've experienced this many times in this lifetime of ours. Right now, if you are sitting somewhere and your smartphone is not in your hand and you're using it, are you normal or abnormal? You're abnormal. What's wrong, man? You can't afford a phone? Huh? What's, what's the matter? You're sad? You're depressed? The norm is now everybody's on their phone. Driving, they're on their phone. In the airport, they're on their phone. Having dinner together on their phone. Right? They take a picture of the same uh, you know, thing and they send it on WhatsApp. But we're sitting on the same table, ya yeah, Sheikh. Yeah, but just so we can have evidence. In case you forgot that we had dinner together. Here you go. Put a star on this message. So now the norm is that people use their smartphone... And it's pretty unusual for someone to say, no, I only like to use old phones. You know, they call the feature phone, the flashlight one that only makes phone calls. And when you send a text message, you take half an hour. <laughs> yeah, remember those? <laughs> Press the button eight times to get to the comma and then you miss it. Then you have to do it again. Oh my God. <laughs> I can't believe we had to do this for so long. 
Now that I think about it, I get frustrated. It's like, why didn't they invent the smartphone earlier? Wasted so much time. <laughs> so people have changed the norm. Normal, normal is abnormal and vice versa. And now, if you are a believer in God, you're pretty abnormal. Oh, what a religious guy. He must be a fail. His life must be a failure. Maybe he couldn't get a girlfriend. Maybe he didn't make it to the basketball team. Maybe he dropped out of school. Maybe, maybe, maybe. That's why he believes in God. And if you're like the all, I have it all, I figured it all out, then, you know, I don't need God anymore. I can just disbelieve in God or be skeptical, doubtful. Maybe there's a God, maybe there isn't. You got a lot of homework to do to prove to me that God exists. So now it's my job and a job of everybody else to try to, you know, articulate to you the concept that God exists. And you're like, hmm, I'm not digging. I don't like it. Like, excuse me, sir. What's going on in the world? If you did this, I don't know how many hundred years ago, people will think you're pretty crazy. And now, it's normal. But we don't care about that. Because human beings are able to change things. That's why they diverted from the natural disposition. The natural disposition proves that you and I were born as believers in the one true God. Now, this raises a question because when, if we, when you speak it to Christians, this opens up a big debate about, well, the original sin and, you know, Jesus dying for the sins of mankind, the crucifixion and the redemption. It's a long discussion. I'm not going to open it now or open a discussion. But it's very interesting when we speak about this concept to determine, okay, now, if you say that we were born into sin, original sinners, then if a child were to die... At a young age, we would assume he's going to hell. Because he was born with the original sin and he had no chance to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. He was too young to understand. Let's say he was one year old, nine months, six months, two years, whatever, you want, whatever age. He still hasn't understood this concept. So uh, technically, he is doomed to hell. Now, of course, they will, they will argue otherwise. But if you go by the text, by the text, he's doomed. In Islam, the text is to the contrary. We have the authentic tradition that the Prophet, peace be upon him, had a vision and he saw an old man in paradise with children. With many children. When he was asked who the old man was, he said that this is Ibrahim, Abraham, who was the forefather of the prophets after Noah. So we have Noah, then Abraham. So Abraham obviously is from the inhabitants of paradise as per the belief of all religious people who believe in, you know, Jude, Jude, uh, Jews, Christians and Muslims. And then the companions of the Prophet raised an interesting question. If children are going, if all these children which they saw and he saw in the vision were, were with Ibrahim in paradise, then does that include the children of the non-Muslim parents? And the Prophet <clears throat> Peace be upon him, acknowledge that that includes the children of the polytheists, meaning those who were born outside of Islam. Because of this narration, we understand that if a child was born into this world, he is in that natural default state of believing in one God. If he were to die before the age of discretion, they go into paradise. Why? Because the natural position is that they believed in one God and they haven't reached a stage where they change that. So we stick to the default. That is mercy right there. And that proves the benevolence and the compassion of God. That no one is held accountable until, meaning the Sharia or the legislative law, you're not held accountable until it is presented to you and then you reject it. But as for the matter of the natural belief that it is instilled in each and every one. And we have verses from the Quran which support that. Now these verses again, for we Muslims, these are not open for debate and discussion. We believe in them 100%. Because they speak, they come from the source which cannot be denied. So if you're going to have a conflict with these verses, I remind you of the introduction of this lecture. It's upon the one who doesn't agree to prove the inauthenticity and the lack of authority of the Quran as a revelation, as a text. If that Cannot, be hap cannot happen, and it has not happened, then we're binded by this information. 
So we have a, here an, an incident that happened that you and I don't recall. And we don't have to recall. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-A'raf, Ayah 173, and mention when your Lord took the children of Adam from their loins, their descendants, and made them testify of themselves, saying to them, Am I not your Lord? They said, Yes, we have testified. So an event took place where we were brought out of the back of our father Adam, all of mankind. And we were made to testify before our Creator that we accept and acknowledge Him as the Lord and Master of the world. And each and every one of us testified. You're saying, I don't remember. See, this is not an incident that you're expected to remember. This didn't happen after you were born or at a young age. This happened before you came into this world and into existence. Before your father met your mother. Be way before everything. This is way before. But this is the explanation of that natural disposition. Why? Lest, unless you should say on the day of resurrection, indeed we were unaware of this. Because that's the excuse of mankind. Oh, I didn't know there was a God. Oh, I didn't know there was a religion I had to follow. I didn't know I had to worship. Who, who said that? According to who? Or lest you say it was only our... This is for those who deny. There's another group of people who worship whatever their forefathers were worshiping. Or lest you say it was only our fathers who associated partners with Allah before. And we were but descendants after them. I mean, we find our fathers doing something, we follow their footsteps. Then would you destroy us for what the falsifiers have done? Then Allah said, And thus do we explain in detail the verses that perhaps they will return. That's the wisdom behind mentioning the story. The explanation is for each one of us to, be, to face himself or herself sincerely. Without beating around the bush and playing around. You know, way deep in there, that there's a creator. And it's very difficult to dismiss this idea. It's very odd to try to prove from so many different scientific sources that there isn't a God. Based on some equations and numbers and all types of stuff, which are all odds, odds, odds. You're going against the odds. It's very difficult to do so. It's an unusual decision. Deep down, you know. Now you can hide that. You can cover it up in a very successful way. And you can reach a point where you fool yourself into believing otherwise. But that is not the norm. And that is not how you were created. This is something that human beings reach usually after some sad event in life. One, two things lead to atheism. Either an event that happens that is very saddening, very depressing, and the person cannot cope with it, then they just say, how can there be a God if, if life is so miserable, or if things are so bad, and they, they just dismiss the idea of God to make themselves feel better. It's usually a, a trauma that happened to that person. Or they just want to have fun so bad, and they don't want to feel guilty so bad. That the only way they can reach that point is by saying, you know what, there's no accountability. If they knew there was accountability, they cannot have as much fun. What prevents a person from committing a crime, knowing that there's a punishment? And for those who say that you can, there's no moral compass for these things, really, can, can you imagine, can any one of you say if, if he had his mother, his own mother, who raised him, and he has a, a knife to her neck, what, what do you need to know that this is wrong? How do you know that this is wrong? Why does everybody judge you as a criminal who killed his mother? Even if you went to court and you had the best lawyer and he proved your innocence, the rest of the people will judge you as a criminal who killed his own mother. There's absolutely no judge. Everybody, believers in God, disbelievers in God, good people, bad, even the worst criminal in prison will say, man, that's pretty bad. 
I mean, okay, you kill a stranger for some money, bad. You kill your own mother, you're just crazy. Because how do you make that judgment? According to what? Who instilled this in you? That you figured out on your own. Where does that come from? Did you learn it from society? No. These are things which are in the fitrah of the son of Adam. They were, we were born with these things. And these are the same things that make us distinguish between good and bad. Between truth and falsehood. Between what is right and what is wrong. Now here, let us look at some of the scientific references for those who are interested in science. But I say this with a disclaimer. And my disclaimer is, science is cool and everything, but, but I have issues with science. Because science is inconsistent and unreliable. It has proven itself over the years to constantly change. So while I appreciate a lot of scientific studies, we know that down the line, another scientific research may be made to prove the opposite. Coffee. Who drinks coffee? Wait, where's my coffee, by the way? Oh yeah, I drank my coffee, but we're supposed to have two. Who drinks, is coffee good or bad? You're an addict, man. Without caffeine, you can't function, you can't study, you can't wake up in the morning. You must have your cup of coffee, otherwise you go crazy. You're an addict. So am I. So they tell you, huh? a group of doctors say, coffee drinkers are like, like, you know, people that smoke pot and like cigarette smokers and they put you in the same category of addicts. People that are substance abusers. They can't function without the existence of this caffeine. And for the longest time, we were made to believe that if you drank coffee, you enjoyed it obviously, but you were still dependent or you made to feel guilty that you can't function without coffee. Then, of course, other studies were made by other doctors to prove that coffee is good for you. And coffee prevents heart attack. And coffee does this. And coffee does that. You read this research or this article, you're like, wow, give me a cup of coffee now. <laughs> Sheesh, I'm going to drink five while reading this article. So now what is it? Is coffee good or coffee bad? Well, I don't know. You don't know. It depends on which article you read last. Because every time I read the other one, I'm like, ah, yeah, I think these guys are right. You know what? Forget about this guy who's trying to tell me coffee is good. I'm still, I'm still dependent on coffee. I need to be independent. And I cannot reach a conclusion. I don't know if you can. Because every time they make a study, it's persuasive enough to say, yeah, this is the one. That's science. And that's just horrible. Because I'm just confused. And this is just a very mundane, trivial issue of coffee. Let alone bigger matters. Go back in time whether the earth was flat or round. Ooh. You know, you could have said something some hundred years ago where people think you're insane. And now you say it, and if you say the opposite, they think you're insane. Really, you think the earth is flat? Why don't you run to the edge and jump off the cliff? <laughs> no, you're just going to go around. Or you run around the earth. I mean, you know, these things are just silly right now. But that's science. So I'm mentioning this, but with... Uh, Mm, yani I'm not very excited about it simply because you can argue to the contrary. But what I'm trying to prove to you is in this citation that even scientifically we have scientists who are persistent and convinced that you were born with the natural dispos disposition of believing in a religion and in a God. And that it is abnormal to go against that. I'm sure there are scientists who oppose that. But it's good to know that there are two sides of the coin. So the Islamic concept of fitra then is supported by physiological, sociological, and anthropological evidence. I know these words are so fancy. Just remember the jikil part at the end. Logical, jikil, jikil, whatever. Yeah. I'm just making it easy for you. So the uh, psychological evidence. The academic, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to read this because I don't want to get too funny. The academic Oliveira Petrovich. Sounds like a nice name, yeah? Petrovich, it's like what? I don't know, anyways. Um, he conducted some studies, I hope it's he, 
Concerning the psychology of the human being, God's existence. Oh, she. She concludes that the belief in a non-anthropomorphic God. Again, non-anthropomorphic anthropomorphism is the concept of the materialization of God in a human form. So any religious person who believes that God is some physical being, be it a statue, idol, Brahma, uh, anything of the sort, Jesus, Mary, any type of human resemblance or even animal resemblance of a God or God being equal to man or animal is anthropomorphism, which Islam rejects tooth and nail because God is not man and man is not God and there's nothing like unto the creator. Nobody's like him in any way, shape or form. But anyways, even that non-anthropomorphic meaning that human beings believe in a God that doesn't look like the idol in the church or the, in the temple or whatever people have invented into a God. It doesn't look like that. It's not anthropomorphic. It's the natural state of a human being. Atheism is a learned psychology. Theism, which is the opposite of atheism, is our natural state. That's according to the doctor. She further said in her quotation, the possibility that some religious beliefs are universal seems to have a stronger empirical foundation that could be inferred from religious texts. We see a lot of religious texts from Judaism, Christianity, Islam that, that revolve around the same idea. Some of the initial findings of research in, uh, into early religious understandings are consistent with other areas of devel uh, developmental research which suggest that there are cognitive universals in a number of domains of human knowledge. So these things have become standards and accepted before. Nowadays, again, they have been all distorted and changed into the opposite. From a sociological evidence, we look at Professor Justin Baird. Professor Baird's research in his book, Born Believers. Yeah. Is this plagiarism? I got nothing to do with it, okay? The title was given to me, I'm just presenting. I mean, if I put the lecture together, but, <laughs> but the title is not mine. We're going to have to send him an email. The science of children's religious belief looked at the behavior and claims of children. He concluded that children believed in what he calls natural religion. This is what I was telling you earlier. This is the idea that there's a personal being that created the entire universe. That being cannot be human. It must be a divine supernatural. Further, scientific research on children's developing minds and supernatural beliefs suggests that children normally and rapidly acquire minds that facilitate belief in supernatural agents. In their mind, they're just agents. They cannot identify exactly what it is. Particularly in the first year after birth, children distinguish between agents and non-agents. Understanding agents are as, as able to move themselves in purposeful ways to pursue goals. They are keen, children, they are keen to find agency around them. They're always trying to fetch for other agents. Even given scant evidence, any evidence you give them, they will accept. No longer after their first birthday, babies appear to understand that agents, but not natural forces or ordinary objects, can create order out of disorder. This tendency to see function and purpose, plus an understanding that purpose and order come from minded beings, makes children likely to see natural phenomena as intentionally created. Who is the creator? Children know people are not good candidates. Children know his father cannot possibly be the creator. His mother, his neighbor, his uncle, they can identify that from a very young age. It must have been a god. Children are born believers of what, I, what he's saying, I call natural religion. So this natural religion is what we call fitrah, which is Islam. So according to that scientific research, children, and you can experience this, don't believe me, don't believe Justin, oh sorry, Professor Justin. You go speak to any child, but don't twist their brain afterwards, huh? be careful. Speak to them at their level of understanding, and see if you can see anyone even remotely suggesting atheism be a norm. Even though this child has absolutely no training. 
Now, if they were trained by their atheist parents, then the child might give you different answers because of that influence. Just like any two parents can influence their children to believe a certain thing is right or a certain thing is wrong. And the children will argue accordingly. But if you were to remove them from this environment where they're being brainwashed, quote unquote, then the natural position of the children is what the professor is referring to, that natural religion. Lastly, the anthropological evidence. It says, consider the atheism of communist Russia and communist China. They still had signs of what you call a worship instinct. I mean, they had these statues of Stalin and, and uh, uh, what is it, Lenin and so on and so forth. So human beings who claim that they want to turn away from worship are in fact immersed in worship. Those who want to claim that they don't want to worship anything, they are in fact the biggest worshippers. Of what though? Of their own ideologies, of their own selves, of different entities that they reverence and they respect. And this is why Allah says in the Quran, in regards to those people, have you not seen the one who has made his God his own desires, his own choices? The person will have so much confidence in their opinion, their alien opinion, until they raise it above everything else and it becomes their object of worship. They're still showing respect to it. Why? Because you were born with the natural need to worship, to admire, to reverence. To be in awe to a greater being. So those who don't find God, they find another idol. That idol can be a singer. American Idol. Do you think these names are coincidental? No way. But that's exactly how it is. Human beings, you become fascinated with a, a person, famous person usually. And you put pictures of them on, on your wall and... You have love for them and appreciation and respect and so on and so forth. And then you see in the world when they see them, huh? they prostrate and bow. He made 12 three-pointers in the game. Prostrate and bow to him. And people, when a rapper is so good, they call him God. Right? Why do they still use the term God? These are people who don't believe in God. He's the God of rap. He's the God of this. He's the God of that. It's in you. It's in you. It's built in. You can't take it out. If you don't channel it and regulate it in the proper way, it will find its own idol. Each one of us, if we reject the oneness of God, the uniqueness of God, which is our next lecture, my next lecture, knowing who God is for real. And I will explain it then inshallah. But until then, if you reject what you're supposed to know, you will find alternatives. No doubt. But... Are these alternatives going to save you when you're put in your grave? Many people don't like to hear that. Say that's too depressing, too negative, too pessimistic. I'm trying to enjoy life. I got a career ahead of me. That's good news, buddy. But the bottom line is people die young. People die young, old, different ages, accidents, all types of stuff. I don't know if you... I, sometimes when I'm extremely bored, I watch crash compilations on YouTube. No, but you know what? I take lessons from it. I swear to God, I, I see crazy stuff. A car, you know, a car going, a family of six, five, six people just driving to some, you know, spot for vacation. And then out of the blue, an 18-wheeler truck, you know, jumps from the other side of the freeway and crashes right into them and smashes them instantly. Do you think they planned this out? Or they knew before they left, this was going to be my last day on earth. I better be nice to people, this, this and that. No way. So when you see these crashes, I mean, you're living, you're normal, you're on your bike, on your motorcycle, in your car, and it's a split second. Another one, even crazier than that, one of these crazy car compilations, there was this, I, and they have this uh, front camera, right? And the dashboard, the dashboard camera. I swear, the, they didn't show the people. They were driving, and a truck drove on the other side of the road a brick one brick it fell off the truck bounced on the ground and crashed right into the windshield to kill the passenger 
All you hear is the driver suddenly screaming. You see the brick, bounces off the ground, then you hear it break into the windshield, and then you don't, they don't show you because it's the dashboard cam, but you hear they saying, oh no, oh no, and it's like you think about it, wow. Like this could be funny, but this is actually sad. I mean, are you kidding me? You're in the passenger seat. Did you really expect the brick to fly out of a truck into your head and kill you? No way. But that's life. So while we can play around a lot, in reality, the real thing we should be concerned about is when my time comes, have I made the right choices? Because you're going to worship. You will definitely worship. Have you worshipped the one who deserves to be worshipped? The one who you know deep inside is worthy of your worship. Okay, I don't know him well enough. No problem. Have you investigated into the matter? Have you researched? Have you given him time? Or are you too busy, buddy? Too busy. No time to look into religion. Why? Religion is old-fashioned now. We're too cool to be religious. We're too cool to study religion. We're too cool to look into this whole God. This is just for people that are depressed. This is not true, my friend. This is for everybody. In fact, the happiest people are those who have sorted that out. And now trying to figure out the rest of their life. Like everybody else. But that part has been resolved already. And those individuals, in comparison to those who have not, are like the difference between the heavens and the earth in terms of how they deal with events in life, how they deal with drama, how they deal with depression, how they deal with failure, success, how they deal with others. That focal point determines how you're going to function for the rest of your life, either with a peace of mind and tranquility or the lack of it. So in conclusion, it's an hour and a minute. In conclusion, I want to speak to your heart more so than I want to speak to your mind. But your mind guides you unless you choose to shut it down. Unless you choose to become deaf. You can be deaf. You can let the words enter your ear, but you give no attention to them. No comprehension. No analysis. Just nice words and let it slide. Or you could be the intelligent human being who observes. You observe the majesty of God in you. In, your, in the creation around you. In your abilities. In the human inventions, human innovations. All of these guide us to believe that the supernatural power, the master who ordained and orchestrated all this, has the most beautiful names and the ultimate attributes. Because this could not have happened any other way. This is far from coincidence. So take that time off from your busy schedule and investigate. No one is, is forcing upon you anything. We don't have the right to force or impose upon any human being, even our opinions. This remains to be opinions. It's ideas. You can accept or reject. But if you take the time to investigate and it's meant for you to see the light, then you shall see the light. This, the calamity is when you don't have time. And then you become regretful. So I ask Allah to open our hearts and minds and allow us to comprehend and see through the darkness. He's able to do all things. هذا والله أعلم وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد. Feel free to ask questions.